Hey, uh, I got a letter today from Lutheran Indian Missions, their ministries, and uh, it's kind of one of those end of year giving letters, but it had this in it, uh, a little excerpt from Psalm 90, and I thought maybe I would just read this kind of as uh, our opening prayer this morning, and the person who wrote this letter, an Alaskan native, um, says, I invite you to consider these excerpts from a native perspective. So, so, it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. And let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. 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 Are there some things we need to tell these people? <laughs> we start our, I can't remember. Well, I don't think so. Okay. Seems like some, I'm something missing. I collect all these notes and then I never know where to start. Anyway, um, let's talk about jumbo. <laughs> now, I hope it's okay. This this chapter really made me laugh. I'm, I mean, I laughed out loud several times in this chapter. Um, and I don't know that there's anything particularly profound here, <laughs> particularly, but it just tickled me somehow. You remember how, how all this happened? Um, in chapter eight, uh, this was last week, uh, Nurburn runs off to kind of give Dan a piece of his mind and he gets brought up short Winona. And on the way there, he, his car starts acting up. Remember that? It was coughing and so forth. And, and uh, so now he's left and, and uh, the car is acting up even worse. <laughs> And a steamy haze is starting to come out through the cab, through the air conditioner vents. He says, come on, baby. I said the truck, you can do it. Well, he has to go off and find a place to fix it. And he's on the reservation and he goes to the reservation town and he's pretty frustrated and he meets Jumbo. Not exactly the mechanic he was looking for. You ever been in that? <laughs> I mean, finding mechanics traumatic enough, right? But um, I think this added a capital T to the business of trauma. So anyway, he has to leave the car there and uh, does it somewhat trepidatiously uh, to get it fixed. And uh, and amazingly, uh, Dan and Grover show up, save the day, and they said, hop in. You're not going anywhere. Quit worrying about your truck. Let's just forget about it. Let's go on a little trip. And so this starts kind of the next section of uh of the book and i think these next few chapters are there's some kind of uh, uh critical incidents in each of them and so as the narrative unfolds around those those are kind of probably what we want to focus on in the last in the next uh time that we have together um i couldn't help but think that um this notion of identity cultural identity really is kind of woven through at least uh, the next three chapters, not so much maybe in the, the last one we read, but, and it kind of got me thinking. So let me just kind of pose a question here. Um, on a scale of one to 10, uh, how, how much do you think about your identity? I guess your cultural identity. You know, if one is, uh, I don't think about it or rarely think about it. And maybe 10 is, yeah, I'm thinking about it quite a bit maybe even worried about or something. Where uh, where would you put yourself on that scale? You can just shout out a number if you want. <laughs> Did you say cultural identity or identity? I kind of said both actually. I'm sort of waffling, I know that. <laughs> you see a difference? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, let's just make a cultural identity. It's kind of hard to separate the two sometimes, though, don't you think? I mean, can you really 
extract your personal identity from the culture in which you're in? I don't know. I would say since I've taken a um, DNA test, I've thought more about my identity. It didn't used to be on my mind. I grew up thinking I was half Dutch and half German, and I was fine with that. And I had a name that was hard to spell because it was Dutch and on and on. My um, recent, not so recent DNA test shows that I'm a, an eighth Jewish. And that was not something that I necessarily knew about. My mother always talked about her um, grandfather, who uh, was from Russia, but was German and actually had converted to uh, Christianity. But I have to say that when I discovered that, it, it made me go back and kind of look at the times of World War II and had my mother been in Nazi Germany, they would have questioned her marriage because being a quarter Jewish, they didn't want offspring being more Jewish than that. So she could not have married somebody that was a quarter Jewish or more, but she could marry somebody that was less than that. So I thought, you know, through a fortunate timing or something, my grandfather left. It was Bessarabia at that time. But I have to say it did impact me because I didn't think I was Jewish. And it's not the sort of um, identity that I was instantly very proud of. It's like I always thought I was Dutch and took great pride in being a tall Dutch person. But being an eighth Jewish has been a real, um, yeah, I've had to think about that. It's, uh, it's kind of changed who and how I think about myself. But yeah. And my mother's maiden name was Adolf. Not that I mean, that was her last name too, but for her, that was kind of a hardship during World War II being having that as a last name. And she got teased a fair amount. So I thought there's, there's things that happened that shouldn't have to impact this, but yeah, they, they do have a bit of an impact. I was surprised. So your identity has kind of changed a little bit then, I guess. How I think I had to cut, I mean, I still can go back as I mostly grew up thinking I was Dutch. So it's not that big of a deal, but I have to say it did kind of rock my feelings about some of that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Identity. Well, I have to admit, because I've been reading an awful lot of, well, not an awful lot, but some very impressive books um, that were recommended to me about the black and white situation in this country and what it made me feel like often over the last year or so is ashamed to be white, oh. you know, embarrassing because I wasn't brought up to dislike anybody of color. And when I, well, of course this was more than a couple of years ago when I read on, on the corner of bitter and sweet, Yeah, I, I cried because I grew up in Seattle and this was going on. Nothing was said in our home and, and things like that just made me feel like, I'm not very proud to be white. Oh. Others. Much about identity, uh, that much, but I was raised in India, you know, where there were brown skinned uh, people and um, I worked in Pakistan where there is the same color of people. And I felt like uh, maybe there was a little bit of, could be a little bit of superiority, but I, I tried not to be superior with people. Um, I mean, I, I just enjoyed being with them. So I, I didn't really, think about the color of my skin that much. Okay. Maybe a little bit, but not much. I didn't realize you'd grown up in India, Tom. Oh. Yep. <laughs> parents of, or my parents were missionaries. Okay. Did you live in a white compound kind of, or how separate were you? Uh, we were in a small little town at the beginning. Yeah. So there's hardly, well, there are a few whites there, but generally there were more Indians, you know. And I went to school where there were missionary kids, so, right. but, and they were from all countries, you know. So, Interesting. just right, a so variety of people. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's a there are a variety of people. I consider myself a world citizen. 
Yeah. Not okay. not necessarily American all the time. Hmm. It's a different background. Yeah. Some 20 years ago or so, um, I kind of experienced what I called a, a low grade depression. And I went to a counselor and at a point he asked me what ethnic background I was. And I said, I'm, I'm thin. And he just laughed. And he said, they don't call them morose fins for nothing. Oh. And I said, I'm paying you good money for that. What <laughs> piece of <money. laughs> I think that's the only thing I remember from him. <laughs> but I do, it did, um, it did make me aware, I guess, of some of the ethnic, at least, uh, influences upon me. <laughs> So what kind of goes into a cultural identity, do you think? It sounds like some of you have kind of changed your thoughts about yourself based on some experiences. I never got a straight out answer out of any of you, whether you're thinking more or less about it here, but that's all right. Well, didn't uh, Just Mercy start us thinking about that? How's that, Don? Well, and, and maybe before that, I, I read... Uh, a book about uh, called the Mayflower and my ancestors didn't come on the Mayflower. That was 1620, but they came in 1630 and uh, uh, the Indian people had pretty well already been wiped out by epidemics of white people's diseases. And beyond that, why there was some warfare early on. So that book made me think about okay where you know where my ancestors were and what they were were doing after uh after they got here and it wasn't very rosy uh i think my aunt the genealogist uh wanted to paint a bit rosier picture than that uh than uh, the way things actually were and, uh, and the natives were not considered uh and, and that we were ripping off their land. The ancestor who did the immigrating by the end of his life, quote, owned a lot of acreage and raised cattle on it. But uh, uh, anyway, so I've been thinking about these things for quite a while. I think my dad had never been out of Iowa until World War II he went into the Army Air Corps and was stationed at an air base near Montgomery. I'm pretty sure it was Montgomery, Alabama. He said it was a great place to spend a war if your skin was the right color. Hmm. And so I think he was fairly shocked by the racism that he encountered in the early 1940s in Alabama. So. So in addition to kind of our beliefs and practices, values, I guess, uh, even relationships, kind of life experiences all kind of coalesce around this uh, and producing kind of a cultural identity, I guess. Language Maybe. is another thing. Language, okay. Any yeah. other kind of features to cultural identity that are important, do you think? I don't see anybody identifying themselves as American culture, though. Everybody's talking about where their people came from. Yeah. Opposed to, because I think uh, the cultural American is very distinct in this world. And can you describe yeah, it, Barb? Um, it's a feeling of optimism, I think, of aggression sometimes. Um, okay. uh, of, I think it's very um, um, open. I think of the cultures in Europe were very closed, especially. Uh, economically and the whole idea of you can be able to what do what you become what you want to become in this country and i know that there's very many limitations to that but it is a persona that we think of i think when we think of americans i, I wonder is that what we think of if we're white versus uh oh i said there's plenty of limitations i'm not trying to make saying it's all no, golden. I, I heard that uh, yeah but I'm wondering if that's more of a white 
understanding of an American. Well, we're all white here, so I guess that would make sense to me. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to add a, a different perspective. What's that, John? Um, I grew up uh, on a farm, small farm, relatively poor, um, and had the advantage of, of uh, going to college. Uh, those kinds of things, I think, are part of what makes me up culturally. Uh, I don't really think an awful lot about being white, but uh, certainly my background experience and my uh, economic experience uh, are a big part of how I think of myself. Well, so I would... I would, you know, give, I'll give you a number. I, I'd probably say maybe four or something in terms of, I think about culture, um, you know, to that extent. Uh, you know, part of it being half Japanese. So um, I, I don't know what box to check off all the time. You know, when it, in my white Asian Pacific Islander combination. Um, and I don't know if we pay as much attention to kind of uh, say, I would say maybe a white American culture, um, but I had an experience today that uh, that kind of brought me back. I, I was at a, a meeting uh, for Presbytery uh, with, um, well, some other folks within the, within the Presbytery. It had to do with wanting to, wanting to reach out to our Korean, some of our Korean pastors to get them more involved in the Presbytery. And, um, there was the this one Korean elder who has this idea for something, um, and I, you know, we were we were having this conversation. I was throwing in some ideas and stuff like that, and I realized as the conversation went on, it's like, well, no, really, this is the idea from this elder, this Korean elder. So there's enough of you know similarities among Asian culture that um, you know I, I start I realized that this. I kind of put myself in the situation like this is my mom and I'm just listening to what he has to say and I have to respect him because he's my elder. And um, in the end, it was like he has this idea, but it, it, it'd be better if it didn't come from him. It would come through some others. And as, as co-moderator of Presbytery, um, you know, that I have a, a particular role. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in the conversation thinking about how different that is from sort of, a, you know, a, kind of a, what I would think of a white American, you know, kind of interaction. Um, and I found myself as sort of like, I am, you know, I am the son in this situation and I need to, you know, respect and honor what my, you know, my elder father, you know, if you will, is, wow. is saying. And I, and I, um, I found myself just kind of slipping into that and realizing, oh, I'm figuring this out now you know um so kind of straddling two two ways of thinking yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. and and in that conversation realizing um how that makes so much sense within say a korean you know mm -hmm. korean hierarchical patriarchal sort of culture which is you know japanese been similar um that oh well this is kind of the way you you do things yeah. Um, and so I, I, I get it now. It just took me a while. I had to kind of shift a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I do find myself thinking about some of these things. That's Sorry. interesting. I, you answered way differently than I would have thought. That just shows how non-normative I am, I guess. I mean, I have to admit, I've never really thought hardly squat about my quote, cultural identity. I just, it was, it's always been assumed. And uh, you all are just much more sensitive than apparently than I am. But it just kind of goes to show again how life experience and so forth kind of challenges. Now, how do you think, it seems to me that Dan's pretty, pretty tuned into this whole business of native identity. Am I right on that? Doesn't he seem to be kind of concerned about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how do you think, how do you, what is important to his identity? from what you've read so far as a native person. You can just shout some things out. What's he afraid of losing? 
which oh, makes me think maybe we think more about identity when it's challenged in some way, you know, uh, or there's a threat against him. Like losing his traditional ways. I mean, the land's already lost, but losing traditional ways, I think, is a huge. And the ceremony, fact that, ritual kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Sacred myth, spirituality. Yeah. And that people sure. like him are losing that too, are not interested yeah. in old ways. I didn't hear what you said, Paul. What? Well, the spirituality, the sacredness of his, okay, yeah. of his yeah. culture. You know? It seems really critical, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 And he's that. thinking about his grandchildren. Yes. Mm. Too. Yeah, I don't think he's afraid of losing it. He's afraid his people are losing oh, it. Correct. And his grandchildren, that they won't have it. Yeah. You know, it kind of makes me wonder what what uh, aspect of my or your, our cultural identity that we're taking away would make me really concerned about losing it. I mean, Barb, you were saying, if we lost our optimism or something, or a depressed nation or something, <laughs> make us start thinking about our, I, I don't know, I just, what is it that's so important? And I mean, that's really cut, given me pause for Dan, very important, uh, you know, I kind of wonder, well, is there anything in my cultural identity <laughs> that I have fear of losing or something? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Yeah. I think of the freedoms we have too, and, and maybe it's being white and privileged, but I know traveling into Central America, Guatemala and Belize and things, I realized how suddenly vulnerable I felt. I thought in America, and maybe it's because of my ethnicity too. I feel safe and protected and like people are, would watch out for me. And if I needed help, I would get it. But traveling in another country, I felt suddenly very vulnerable that I maybe wasn't quite as important, more important than maybe local people because people would come to my aid. But I think we have a lot of, um, there's some power to being an American and granted a white American, but um, there's some protection there. Mm -hmm. Has that been threatened lately from your point of view? That sense. Uh, I think it, the respect of Americans might be changing, but I think whether they're valid or not, and you can have people argue on both sides. There's about thirty to thirty-five percent of the country that really thinks something is being taken away from them, and have been very vocal and, in some ways, violent about it. Um, so I think um, I think all the time when I hear those complaints from that percentage of people I'm like but you won't listen to the other people who have been saying that about their own experience for like 200 plus years so um mm -hmm. it's suddenly very important when it's you um but you won't listen to anyone else so um I, like I said whether whether they have a valid point or not there's some people who really do think some things are being taken away no I'd agree with you I think a lot of the pushback that we see politically, religiously, whatever, um, is probably related to a sense of potential loss and identity, whatever identity is espoused there. I mean, that kind of, I mean, looking at it <laughs> another way, I mean, I think we need to be aware that there's a story behind all that pushback and, you know, what is the nature of the loss that people are experiencing? You may not agree with it always, but, um, that sense of loss, at least in if Dan's experience is any indication, is pretty powerful. And uh, as you see how people would push back. Yeah. I think well, uh, well, go right ahead, Don. Excuse me. Our country is headed towards a state where white people are going to be the minority. And I think a lot of people are threatened by that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel threatened by that, but I think a lot of people do. Uh, feel threatened by the idea of becoming a minority in our country. I think another thing is that we whites or Americans feel that we know better than anybody else what, how to do things. We, we know how to change things. We're not willing to listen to what other people have to say. 
And I think uh, another thing is that we're considered as arrogant and loud. Yeah. Gee, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead, Arthur. <laughs> well, no, it's when we say our country, <laughs> you know, it's not, you may be thinking as a white, you know, fairly privileged American, but it's not, it's much broader than that. Other people would call it our country too. And they might come from quite a different cultural background, but we are so presumptuous that <laughs> we think of our country as from our experience more, I think, than we do the whole. Well, not that's, that's not new, I would say. I mean, if you look at like British colonialism, which that's what our country came out of, they did the same thing, maybe just a little less loudly. They, I think we we're a little more brash, like Tom was saying about we're the fierce independents that are going to tell you what we think. But that concept of we know the more civilized way of doing things, we kept that from our, from, I, I shouldn't say our, because, you know, all of us aren't descended from the British line, but like from that like parent country piece. Um, and so it just extended to <laughs> one of its offspring, I guess. Kind of I don't, became part I don't of our national nice. character, I guess, didn't it? Yeah, excuse me, I cut somebody off, I'm sorry. Right. I said, I don't think it's new. I just think it's, we, we like to think of things from our own perspective and everybody does other countries and other cultures as well. But as Sarah was mentioning, it's kind of interesting because we're sitting here as a bunch of Presbyterians. I mean, if, if you look at uh, what Scottish Presbyterians were doing, I mean, they were being sent all over the world to civilize the rest of the world. And so, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess we're maybe we're direct descendants of that. Uh, but I mean, I, I'm only half Scottish, so I'm not, I'm not copping to the whole guilt plate. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's an interesting thing, and just in terms of trying to fit in. I mean, my, my father was, uh, you know, the, the first generation American, um, and, you know, he was raised going to Greek school and, you know, trying to maintain their culture and all the rest of it. I mean, he could not wait to get out of the house and be done with his culture. I mean, he was sick and tired of it. And, uh, you know, he had hundreds of cousins, and he kept in touch with one of them. I mean, he just, he couldn't stand it. He just wanted to be American. I mean, he, he didn't see the point of going to special schools and separating yourself from the rest of the community. And so it was funny, though, because my brothers and I picked on him the rest of his life about if he had just taught us something Greek, we might have been, you know, had some interest in our culture. And he's like, trust me, I knew it. It isn't worth it. Move on. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Wow. Well, being raised in, in a household of, of music, and loving to sing and growing up just after the Second World War, there were all these patriotic songs that we were taught in school. I don't know if other schools did it or not, but in Seattle, Ballard, in Ballard. <clears throat> and um, boy, I love to sing those. And then in high school, uh, we had a song about, that was the words of, that are on the Statue of Liberty where you're supposed to be welcoming all these people from every place yeah, tired. Mm -hmm. and and now i can't i couldn't sing any of those songs i don't feel i live in the land of the free and all of these terms because of what has been coming out so much yeah. in the racial disparity in the last couple of years i think people being shut up at home because of COVID, there's just been all this much more in the news and, and what's happened to black people and, and people of you know different colors, how they're treated elsewhere and stuff. And it really, it's taken all my joy out of so many of these things that meant something to me and, and I'm not proud of it. So your identity's kind of been shaken really. Yeah. It? Yeah, it has, okay. See some nods out there. Yeah, now, we need to kind of get back into the book here, maybe. But let me just ask one other question. How, how do you see your identity as a Christian in relation to this discussion we've had, your culture, whatever? 
Is it distinct? Is it part of one and the same? <laughs> How is it affected by the culture that you identify with? Christianity teaches us to love all people. All people are our neighbors. <laughs> Preach it, Rosalie. It's good. I'm proud to be Presbyterian. <clears throat> Why? <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> because it's open uh, to a lot of uh, ways in which you can be accepted in the community. It's not rigid. It's open to... Uh, to people, you mean, kind of? Yes. Yeah, okay. And, I mean, we and, do have our forms, you know. So. Yes, but it, it's open to different ways of thinking. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I would say proud to be a Presbyterian, but as I think of, as I'm thinking when Tom says that about the stances our church has taken in the last, continues to take in terms of cultural diversity and um, just, just the overall um, support of all, all people, regardless of their color, race or creed. I, um, so I guess I, I guess I am proud to be a Presbyterian too, Tom, as you say that, so. May we try to be inclusive. We're not exclusive. We are inclusive. I mean, our, that's what, what I appreciate. The fact that we're democratic, I mean, our government was based on the Presbyterian form of the fact that we have a session we have. I mean, we're representative, and that's not typical of every religion. I mean, Catholics go from the Pope down with their, their power, and we are very democratic, and I think there's a fairness potential fairness and goodness based on that. We may not always hit the mark on that too, but yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that too. Okay. Good. All think, right, well, minute, one more Wayne, comment here, excuse me. One more, yeah. Wayne, I think my Christian identity is very counter, counter uh, cultural. I don't see a whole lot in the gospels and the understanding of the kingdom of God I, I just don't see a whole lot that relates to um, our American culture. I think the Christian culture is very, very much countercultural. Um, so I, I guess I, that's where I would stand. Oh, that's good. Anybody okay. want to pick up on that? Yeah, I'll throw one, one more thing and it might segue back to where you might want to go. Um, but up in Alaska this summer, the dedication of this welcome poll in Metlakatla, uh, the pastor there was talking about how the significance of having this totem at the church, uh, you know, representing kind of a cross between, you know, indigenous culture, spirituality, and Christianity. And one of the things he said was that to him that was symbolizing that you can be native and Christian, which was not the message from, from the church throughout you know, the, the boarding schools and things like that. So um, there's a part of this discussion for me is making me think a little bit about, yeah, Stan, I agree with you that Christianity is countercultural, um, but at the same time, go ahead. Yeah, we live in the world. <laughs> Yeah, we live in the world, and uh, there are things, the ways that we might interpret faith or exhibit our faith that we cannot pull away so much from our culture. And um, the importance of having conversation around it is that it opens us up to realize that our lens through which we see Jesus and through which, you know, Jesus works to see through us, if you will, or into the world, however you look at that, it's not the same for, for everyone, but we can learn from one another, you know, in the context of conversation. Um, yeah. Good. Well, having kind of 
gotten obsessed with his national identity, I guess I, I came up with a little alliteration for the next three chapters, and I was probably really stretching it, so forgive me. But so chapter 10, the ponytails and jewelry I see is kind of identity is form without substance. So kind of phony identity. There's a point in there we can talk about that. The chapter 11, selling the sacred is sort of prostituting one's identity. And chapter 12 might be sort of changing or expanding or growing one's identity that on uh, the chapter entitled Welcome to Land. So uh, I would invite you to, as we go through these, if there are some passages that speak to you, and surely there are, there's some good passages in here, feel free to uh, pinpoint those and read them and make a comment about them if you like. And, um, and that'll kind of get us started. But uh, this chapter 10, Ponytails and Jewelry, so uh, Nurburn is abducted and uh, they're off on a road trip, yay. And um, uh, he needs to call his family and they stop for a double bacon cheeseburger and fries, as I recall at a truck stop on the road. And, uh, and there's this hippie family there or what Dan refers to as a hippie family, remember that? It's a... Uh, parents and a couple of kids and an old school bus and it just sets Dan off kind of irritates him it's kind of an irritant you remember why he was so irritated just jogging your memory here a little bit he, he thought they were uh, Indian wannabes yeah yeah One yeah and, and what really bugged him was that if they he was afraid that if they saw him with his long ponytail, they would just zero in on him and want to talk to an authentic, you know, Indian and, and take his picture and so forth. And he just he just gets really upset about that. So it's kind of like form without substance. Now, Ruth kind of raised a question. She says, well, is Dan being fair in his assessment of these hippie people? I mean, you know. I mean, how fair is that? They wanted that identity. Why couldn't they have that identity? Actually, Dan actually says, if you want to come to our powwows and dance, they can do that. But somehow Dan senses that these guys, there's just a phoniness about him. And I'm not sure quite why he thinks that. What is it that really irritates him, do you think? Martha, you were shaking your head. Did you have something to say? Trying to unmute myself. <laughs> what? Okay. I'm trying to unmute myself. It's just his prejudice, too. I mean, it's. Uh, he's coming Dan's with his prejudice. baggage. He's coming with his baggage. It's real baggage. But I just think of, of if we were someplace visiting another culture we would be curious, we would ask questions, we would take pictures as a tourist. It's, it's not any different. <laughs> so and, it's but it did, you asked us the question, what? So it's harmless then, because it's normal? Ooh. Oh yes, it's harm, well, those like hippie wannabes in the van, yes, they're harmless. Okay. They're trying, they're in their way, trying to understand, they're valuing what they're learning about Native Americans. That's all, that's what they're doing, is valuing them and trying to understand them from their little, the place that they're at. Um, so, but so you Bob asked has the question. another thought on that. Go ahead, Bob. Well, <laughs> I got to finish. The only note I took here is you asked how, how, what okay. our, where our perception of Native Americans came from. And I can picture traveling. My dad would like to take vacations and we go out west. And I can remember the woman, the women sitting there in their Native clothes doing some Native thing, like weaving probably on a loom. And that, my dad taking pictures of them and i'm and so when dan said his mom sat there and people could take a picture for five cents i thought oh my gosh <laughs> i just i think the, the people we were seeing were just either hired by a by a museum or a cultural st a stop and to sit there and be representative or maybe they had the box out like a busker to get their 
picture taken. Money. <laughs> so. Go ahead, no, Bob. I th- oh. Oh. No, I, well, I think I think Grover was more uh, uh, willing to forgive and, and assume that people were trying to learn something about the culture. But I think Dan's problem, big problem, was the presumption. I mean, he didn't want the hippie guy from the bus coming over and talking to him as though the fact that he had long hair and some Indian jewelry made him understand Dan. I think it was the presumption that somehow, you know, that they could communicate and he already understood him that really bothered him. I think you're right. Yes, I would agree with that. Being taken advantage of too. On page 120, it talks a lot about how the people would, or it must have been his grandma would take a, you know, sit on a blanket, they take a picture and give her a nickel. And pretty soon he said they didn't even give her the nickel. It's like, you know, she never made any money. It's, it's that same thing of being a novelty, being exotic, adding color to the culture. And I think he felt it was not a fair, it was a novelty. It wasn't because people wanted to understand. It's because they were taking advantage and gleaning the best of Indian culture because it made them feel better and made them feel novel. And I think he just felt uh, kind of, ex- I don't know, taken advantage of. Because that's all they, because they couldn't, they were not in a position to understand. It was not their culture. It's not something you can read a book and go visit someplace and, and understand. So they were, you know, do you suppose a black person, if we went and did a little mission trip someplace and ask questions and, I mean, I suppose we wouldn't try to act black but we would, I mean, it depends on the sincerity of the people. And so I guess that's what maybe you were saying there, Bob and Jody, um, that, that I think Dan is coming from, he's an old man, he's, he's 80, he's seeped in it, he's absorbed the, he's living, his grand, his parents and grandparents' culture, or the he's so I just I just think he's having the tough time of it. This, this right, also, right, rightly so. A little quote from it says, "Um, it says the old man he says, yeah, I know." He says, "But I just don't want people thinking that taking a picture of us and having us talk at the school class is the same as knowing us, oh, or that buying a dream catcher and going to a powwow, you know, makes someone an Indian. You can't buy a culture by giving us a nickel." <laughs> I think it, yeah, I think, think he felt it just cheapened, cheapened them. Yeah. You can't really know us. And I think that's, yeah, that's the superficiality of that he's, that, that gets him concerned. So, you know, uh, identity is kind of a form without substance. Moving on, selling the sacred. This was kind of an important chapter, I thought. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and he's, you know, as opposed to just merely buying Indian artifacts or whatever, the thing that troubles Dan most in this chapter is Native people selling their birthright, as it were, by by giving away, um, yeah, by what what. Uh, by selling sacred items or their sacred ways. He calls it their birthright. And that really bothers him. And I think that goes back to what somebody said earlier about he's hoping there's a legacy left for, you know, his children and and grandchildren. And uh, if they give it all away, then, you know, it's kind of a problem. So he gets, he kind of gets into this thing, what makes something sacred? And I thought that was really interesting. Did any of you catch that on, I think, Page 126, 127. If you can buy it, it's not sacred. That was one aspect of it, wasn't it? Yeah. If you can buy it, it's not sacred. When something is sacred, it does not have a price. I don't care if it is white people talking about heaven or Indian people talking about ceremonies. If you can buy it, it isn't sacred. And once you start to sell it, it doesn't matter whether you're reason reasons are good or not you are taking what is sacred and making it ordinary i think he's afraid of those people who are selling things like that mm-hmm. afraid of that they're losing a sense of who they are they're losing a sense of the value of their culture um, 
it isn't simply teaching, it isn't simply, you know, giving or even selling things, but it's somehow he senses they're losing the value of who they are. And that's what and it goes back to identity, doesn't it? I mean, really? Yeah, yeah. It goes back Indians, to, go ahead. Just say it goes back to the oppression too. Their, their culture has been so diluted anyway by being forced to assimilate and all the things they had to give up that what little they have then he feels is worth holding onto and is sacred. And even that people because of poverty or whatever else are, are trying to sell that too. Yeah, I think it's, he's horrified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there, can you get your head around his sense of sacred? I mean, is there some way you can define it? <laughs> in a meaningful way, anybody take a stab at that? What makes something sacred? We can kind of turn that around on our own sense of what is sacred too, maybe. What he says is what we have in our hearts and in our ceremonies. That's what's sacred for him. Now, I'm not sure if I can define it any more than that, but in our hearts and in our ceremonies, he says. That's what's he goes left. into a little discussion of this when we were talking, when he was talking about tobacco. That tobacco yeah. that you smoke recreationally isn't sacred. It's only sacred if you make it sacred. Uh, you make it sacred by giving it or doing something other than earning money out of it. Mm -hmm. Does that inform? your own sense of what is sacred as a Christian at all, or do you make a connection with that? Well, with the tobacco, it was sending the tobacco, the, the smoke up to God, so it's communing with God. Right. And it does have a connection. There is an aspect of promise or fidelity in that, as I recall, too, when that was being discussed, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think as Christians, we have certain customs and, and, and acts that we carry out that help connect us to our faith. I, I, a woman who worked, I worked with, worked for me that um, I think she, her husband was a quarter or an eighth. And so her kids were, her kids were Jamestown kids and they took the language classes, the Jamestown language classes. Her son was quite artistic. He did some carving. Um, some painting, um, but but I know as they grew, um, they both married non-Indians and they got caught up in life, you know, and not and and have I don't want to say they've drifted away, but their lives are consumed with just living and um, not necessarily. I think they've kind of lost their connection. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've lost their connection. Actually, they're not as active in their in their fellowship or whatever you want to call that with their native roots. And um, I kind of think that's a little bit about what he's, a, you know, it's 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 the people are losing their connection and. You know, I see that in this just little microcosm of a family that really good people, but you know, life carries you on, and now you've you've got one more um, division or segregation from your roots, and it, it it I think it must be scary. You know, would be scary for those elders that are trying to um, continue this this sacred co uh, communion with with the earth or however you want to describe that so and paul do you think part of that is as some of those native groups have married into the white culture over generations their outward appearance changes and so i would think that if you did resemble a native person or a black person or a hispanic person it might be harder to kind of assimilate as easily and get away from your culture in some ways because the world around you allows you to do that as opposed to keeping you in a box because you look a certain way. So I wonder if that has 
a piece to play in it as well. Code switching? Mm -hmm. Like passing, you yeah. know? Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm certain that if you don't look, if you don't look like you're part of the culture, it's, it's easier to drift away. I, I mean, it's, you know, um, I think you get, I mean, obviously you, you get treated differently if you look like you're a native as opposed to not looking like you're a native. I think, and I'm not saying that's bad. I think it's just, just a natural thing that people do to respect and observe who, who they're involved with. And I think it's, it's just easier for people who for several generations down that don't look the part to, to drift away from the, from their ancestry. There's something I wanted to comment on this chapter. And to me, it leads up to maybe what's sacred, but it was the intimacy between Dan and Grover you know, as they're in this car traveling and as it's getting dark, you know, they begin to sing a little bit. And then, um, then uh, the author, you know, is very touched. In fact, he almost begins sobbing because, well, he was sobbing because of this very special sharing between these two men, which I thought was almost like preparing them for the sacred part later. But I, I think there's something so important about, the intimacy that happened with these men at that time that to me, I don't know, it, it's, um, to me, it's somehow tied with religion. It's somehow tied with what's sacred, or maybe it's like, it's like when you prepare yourself for worship, these guys were preparing themselves to be maybe near something sacred to you. I just, I just thought it was such a touching time. Mm -hmm. Well, wasn't it the next morning then when they, had the fire and this the drumming and the tobacco yeah yeah actually that i is, agree with you Jody. that was the next chapter yeah. yeah so paul when you were what you were talking it made me think of of bob then talking about his dad and the greek culture of of you know being steeped in that and and i read a book about a orthodox jew the the woman marrying into that culture and then escaping out of it and um so if a a culture is very different from the culture around you then which i haven't experienced that it just seemed very similar and i would say maybe for me what i can relate to the most is when I read things that are about um, an agrarian culture, then that is maybe was our identity more in the past of America and that we're left, that's more of a rare thing anymore, especially to be a farmer. You might live in a rural setting, but you're not necessarily a farming culture, agricultural setting. Uh, one more quick yes yeah, so i think that what you say that they're they're the them preparing this the grover and dan and the things that dan when he goes off by himself and reveals things or he's just out there communing with nature and what's he's singing or that that what's going on there for him and that experience and then how that might be him be preparing, knowing, learning what his next move is with Nurburn, I think. He seems to be moving Nurburn along and it kind of comes to a head in that next chapter, I think. Yeah. He, Dan gets sort of steely eyed and seems to have a sort of rage. But Bob, you were trying to say something there before. No? Oh, yeah. oh it's you, I'm sorry. Um, um, I just um, reading this kind of gave me a little different perspective when it's talking about the spiritual connection to objects. And um, we were talking with a friend of ours who's in the inland Northwest Presbytery, and they had a um, 
they were trying to reach out to a couple of the churches in their presbytery that were of native, they were native churches and feeling kind of disconnected. And, and they were well, like, what can we do to try to help facilitate making you guys feel more a part of things? And, and, and um, one of the things they brought up was this, you know, they have Camp Spalding and uh, the, 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 the Spalding name is like all over the place. And it was this group of Presbyterian ministry uh, missionaries that came in and basically took all of their artifacts and things eventually got sold off to, you know, museums and stuff. And, and so the Presbytery decided they were going to go after them. So they tracked down all of these artifacts that ended up in different museums and different people's private collections and whatever, and they bought them all back and um, presented them to the churches that they originally were belonging to. And at the time I thought, oh, this is great. I'm so glad to see the church finally doing some things that are positive in that way. But I didn't make the connection that like they were returning something sacred to them. It wasn't just an item Mm -hmm. that was theirs and was stolen and was taken. It was more like, we're giving you a piece of your history, your faith and your religion. And we welcome you, you know, into our fold with the knowledge that we want to, this is important to you. And we understand that and want to make restitution for that. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting take that I hadn't really picked up before I had read that chapter about the significance of that. Sort of a, a real demonstration of maybe respect in, in a meaningful sort of way there. It sounds like, yeah, that's neat. All right, where are we? What time is it? Oh my gosh. 7.57. <laughs> We're about out of time here. Um, hey, can we, we've kind of beat on identity enough, maybe. <laughs> I mean, there's, are, is there something that needs to be read that's right at the tip of your tongue? <laughs> Go ahead and read something. I've kind of lost it now. <laughs> oh, she found it. Okay. Well, I thought it was interesting that, you know, Dan would make these little speeches and it seemed like he was trying to get Nurburn on track of what this was all about. Um, and why he wants his story to come out, you know, what's important about it. And there were some passages, I think. I like to the one that he says, I was too angry. Yeah, and on page 138, he says, uh, you know, he, he talked to his grandfathers up on the hill and they told me that anger is only for the one who speaks. It never opens the heart of one who listens. Yeah. And the enemy is blindness to each other's ways. Put away your anger, they said. Our earth is crying now, and we need to, re- to remove her tears. I thought it was interesting, too, when he said, you have white man's eyes. Mm-hmm. You can yeah, he, that was his gift. It was that he could see through the white man's eyes and the, his people's eyes. And then I thought it was interesting that, you know, and he says, someone will come, they said. Then they gave me that song and he's trying to make the case to Nurburn. I mean, he's almost like the Messiah that's coming (laughs) to help. And he asked for help, which Nurburn must have thought or thought was, must have been very hard for him, you know, because they had this civil civilization and culture and everything that was whole. And then it all got messed up when white people came and kind of took over and tried to assimilate them. And here's this proud, dignified man asking, having to ask Nurburn for help to write his story. When Nurburn says, forgive me, do you think that's what he means? He realizes that how much the white people have taken from him and he came in thinking he could do everything right and write this story. And then he just says so simply and starts to cry and says, just forgive me. And I think 
that changes everything. But I loved what he said too. It goes, uh, what Dan says, you know, I'm reaching out to you, Nurbur, and you must help the grandchildren too. If you're afraid or if you are too small, it's too late. You are here. <laughs> kind of like Moses trying to get out of yeah. his job, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I found that whole portion of the book incredibly Christian. I mean, I, I yeah. thought his description yeah. of you know, what his message from the creator was very Christian in its message in terms of calling and, and surrendering and then listening to, to what God is telling you. I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, I, that, that could have been written by a Christian or spoken by a Christian as, as well as it was by Dan. So. No. See some nods. Another very poignant uh, line I thought was on page 40, 142. You destroy, um, you know, where he welcomes Dan to our land. And he says, that is why I am, I am welcoming you. Our people tried to welcome your people once before, but you destroyed the welcome. You destroyed it with crosses and diseases and whiskey and guns. The crosses are right up there with the diseases, the whiskey and the guns. Pretty stark, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, Dan, uh, or I mean, Nurburn has a real change of heart in this chapter. If you remember his outburst to Winona back in chapter uh, uh, eight, when he was just so fed up and he was going to quit and all that. And then here he kind of, in response to Dan's sort of steely eyed gaze and Dan's insistent that he starts seeing and he learned how to see, uh, you know, he. Uh, he says, suddenly I knew the fury behind those eyes. I heard the echo of a thousand dead voices of women and children, old men, too slow to run when the Hoshkiss guns were turned against him. And he goes on down there. He says, uh, help me. It must have been the hardest sentence in the world for him to say. All these images swirling out of control. The shame of my own blood surged through me. He should not need my help. His people had been whole. His truth had been singular, unassailable, and balanced with the land. It was my people, my race, my heritage that placed him before me like this. The last chapter called Tatanka really is an exercise in Nurburn learning how to see. And I think it takes off from this chapter. It's really interesting to me. Remember the incident with the buffalo? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we need to close here, but just <laughs> seeing is, was just not the sort of mechanical sense of observation. At one point, Dan is asking him about the land and he's, and Nurburn says, yeah, this is a pretty place. But seeing is more than just observation. <laughs> there is this kind of seeing where the thing seen it's sort of interactive. You you kind of it, it reveals itself, and it just kind of reminded me the whole idea of revelation. You know, it's like remember Peter and Jesus, and and there's a discussion. Jesus says, "Who do you think I am?" And you know, he says, "Some people think you're John the Baptist or Isaiah or whatever." And then Jesus says, "Well, who do you think I am?" And he says, "Well, I think you're the Messiah." And Jesus says, you know, you didn't get that on your own, did you? And this whole idea of revelation as it is deeper than mere observation. And I, I really kind of appreciated that point of view. And there, it's interesting how that applied to even observing the natural order, kind of seeing beyond the mere observation, what is being revealed to you in the process of looking at that thing. And it was, it's sort of, I guess, um, must be how the land becomes more sacred. It's just not a pretty place in native spirituality, but it reveals, reveals uh, something about the spirit of the land, the spirit of the creator and so forth. Um, you know, in a couple of weeks, I think we're going to have what I've come to think in my mind as the talk. Uh, there's a couple of issues I hope we can get to, and it might be helpful. And uh, so let me give you a little bit of, of um, homework, if you can think about it. 
see if you can't begin to identify the characteristics of Dan's belief system. Just, you know, if you note them when you're reading, just jot them down or maybe start making a little list. Kind of just keep track. What is it that makes up Dan's spirituality, if you want to use that word? Basically, is I would say his belief system. What, what are all the parts and pieces of that ceremonially, relationally, uh, his relationship to creator? So just, just keep track of that, okay? Kind of have that in mind. And uh, maybe this will enrich our discussion a couple of sessions down the line. Um, I just think I'll just leave it at that. I don't <laughs> just start doing that. You'll be ready. How's that? Um, well, any last thoughts? Anybody didn't get something read that needed to be read? Thanks for your, your thoughts tonight. Appreciate it a lot. It's good. I'm going to read this excerpt from Psalm 90, 90 again before we go. Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. And let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. Thanks once again. Hope to see you. Thank you. Another week. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's been fun. Thank Good night. You. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.